So, thank you very much uh, for being invited uh, to give a talk here. Um, can you switch on my... Oh, yeah, okay. Okay, we are users uh, of um, a uh, uh, platform from the Human Brain Project. Um, our interest is uh, to uh, test functionalities in the brain, connecting it with a robot. So uh, what we are studying actually is uh, where is motion coming from, how to grasp, uh, how to connect the eyes uh, with the motoric part and to build control systems which are able to run a robot. And uh, of course, it's interesting to uh, study um, how to learn it, how to train such systems, and uh, which are which neural models are useful uh, to use. So, in the uh, previous talk, uh, it was very interesting to see what type of neurons are uh, you studying, how to combine them, and uh, the platform, the neural platform, which is available. Um, is in eBrain is uh, offering some robots, uh, an environment modeler, and uh, then uh, to um, some sensors, and then to connect it with uh, brains uh, wherever which part is of interest. Okay, this is a, uh, where we are looking for uh, our uh, neuromorphic principle good for uh, robot control. I can say yes. Neurons are spiking uh, with spikes. Uh, these are signals over time. You can combine them. You can model closed loop systems. And you can also interface amplifiers with this type of. Uh... Okay, it works. So, this is in the factory here. We have built some uh, uh, walking systems. They are all controlled by neurons. But not spiking one, we did use, use uh, classical neurons and uh, perceptrons to combine, uh, to make leg synchronizations, uh, to move individual legs to integrate some sensors, and uh, continued to develop that. Uh, there are now robots with muscle models, so we have agonist and antagonist, and uh, interface them with a uh, neural part, and it's possible also to. Uh, move uh, and to uh, move forward, climbing, and uh, some special skills have been trained with this type. We continue the work now. Uh, working machines are in the sixth generation, and uh, several years we are um, give, <laughs> we are using a spiking uh, neurons for control instead of classical triggering uh, perceptrons, uh, which we used in the first phase. So if you look forward, um, for which type of robot uh, robots this is interesting, here you see different robots, and uh, each of them is autonomous. And uh, these systems you see here are all model-based. And uh, we believe that the brain is working different, that it's event-driven, and uh, that prediction is important, and there are some triggering mechanisms to be realized. However, it's possible this is an autonomous uh, system with two arms. This is a prototype of a three-finger system. We continue now to develop five-finger system. Grasping is very interesting, integrating haptics and uh, the visual uh, 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 perception and then uh, manipulating objects. So the robots become more and more human like over time. You see here a system with uh, five finger hands uh, with two eyes. If we look to the software, uh, here we have about 100,000 lines of code uh, programming. This system is about uh, 600,000 um, 600, lines of code. And if you go to the humanoid system with two arms, five fingers, and eyes, it's more than a million lines of codes. To program this is cumbersome. So we are hoping to apply uh, the neurons and the knowledge of the Human Brain Project to plug functional components together, 
in the sense, as in the previous talk, it has been uh, presented, and, and then uh, to build uh, systems with elements. So even this system is uh, uh, part we are looking for. This has actually 72 joints. A human has much more, more than 100 uh, joints if you add a spine. Um, here we have 72 motors. And uh, if you look to the muscles, the main muscle parts for, the, for moving the uh, human body is, I think, more than 1,000. And uh, this has to be controlled, to be connected with a skeleton, and then uh, to run a robot. Only to give you an idea what is robotics and uh, what uh, is the brain. Looking to programming, what I mentioned before is most of the system are textually programmed. It's a tremendous work to generate a code, to test it, to connect it with a machine, to make experiments, and to add some learning capabilities. Then we have this uh, shared programming, which is symbolic and sub-symbolic programming, to go down to the controls. And then uh, these are more classical programming techniques which are used today in robotics in industry or in other applications. Uh, some Planners are available generating uh, uh, automatically programs, the geometric model, kinematic models, and then to generate a system. Strategy graphs, which have a uh, limited point of view to predict and uh, to compute what is adequate reaction and what to do. These are planners. And then um, how to generalize uh, the programs so that the robot can do not only one task, but maybe tasks in a changing world and to adapt. Alternatives are, of course, uh, sub-symbolic programming. And so we think that neural programs are, are useful for certain applications. I will show you some examples. Uh, what is done today is end-to-end -end trajectory, move from A to B or walk from A to B. Uh, this is uh, existing. Uh, you can apply reinforcement learning, policy learning, uh, which requires some abstraction to do this type of uh, work. And the reinforcement learning are some mechanism we believe that in the brain this uh, is used. It's a multi-level reinforcement learning. The question is how to optimize locally so that uh, globally we can achieve good results. Then learning predictive models is very important if you do every, anything, for example, playing table tennis, you must predict what happens, uh, what will be the next action. If you play tennis or if you do other things, prediction is uh, steering the focus of interest of the perceptive systems. You look to things which are relevant for the next action, and then the brain computes that. The question is how to generate uh, programs, neural programs, automatically, or maybe they are to be learned to find some structures, to use the plasticity and uh, to form a functional unit with adequate weights. And then, of course, uh, functional neural networks, um, spiking um, networks are uh, possible um, to train them to use the plasticity and to build controllers, control loops, open loop, closed loop controls, different ways. Okay, the question is now, is this useful for robots? This was the first question, can we apply that, what we learn in the human brain to robots, and we want to show that, and we want to convince industry that there is hardware and software available, actually, and this can be used. It's not easy, but um, there are some companies uh, really interested in to uh, go into that field. So uh, the dream is, of course, to have uh, low power for these uh, systems uh, approximating uh, uh, low power of the brain uh, to make the uh, system more reliable, um, how to exploit the high connectivity and the plasticity to train uh, these uh, systems. And then, uh, yeah, these are all problems to be solved, how to integrate sensor motor information to move the hand, to move the muscles, uh, to reach a goal or to interact with the environment. Then time is important, triggering at the right time the actions. So 
So with spiking neurons, it's much better than with uh, classical neural nets. There you need synchronization mechanisms, and uh, with the spikes, you have automatically synchronization mechanism. And the question is, uh, what about adaptive control? Sometimes a robot needs position control, trajectory control, force control, uh, impedance control. So there are a lot of different controllers depending on the actual situation, and the brain is able to activate and to deactivate them and have smooth transitions between the ways. So the, for control engineers, this is a very interesting field to have uh, this plasticity, adaptivity. We call it multi-structural controls, not uh, parametric controls. Okay, and then um, how it could be realized, um, how to work with them, is there some deep learning mechanism there, and uh, what, uh, how do, oh, we have to train. So some assumptions have to be done, which are uh, important when modeling such systems. Uh, this is uh, how to train uh, neural networks. Is this uh, backpropagation over which time area? Do we have short memory? Do we have uh, long uh, 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 memories? And uh, the other one is uh, how to process the synapses and the neurons, how to exploit the plasticity rules or how to apply plasticity rules, and then which type of learning and from global point of view we are studying. Okay, this is the engineering part. Uh, before, but it must be made clear if you want to run a robot with uh, spiking neurons and to implement and to study functional areas of the brain. One is to link it to the perceptive part. The other one is uh, to link it to the motor part, which may be localized in the, um, in the uh, cerebellum. But it has to be connected with the visual part. Okay. Then what type of neurons? There are a lot of neurons. Uh, neurons which can be implement, uh, implemented in a technical point of view have three, four parameters. But uh, if you look closer to the neurons, it's much more complex. But we are looking to have some uh, working. The frequency for real control is about 100 hertz, so it's a small bandwidth control, but uh, exploiting high uh, parallelism and then some kind of uh, logic. Here are examples of what uh, nature can do that, and then with, uh, I think, uh, a limited number of neurons, but it's fantastic what this uh, being can do. Uh, beams with uh, nearly one million uh, also here. The mouse, which is studied in the neurorobotics uh, project, uh, the brain with, uh, uh, to coordinate the limbs and to use the whiskers and uh, to uh, use the smell. Here um, in the atlas, there are 75 million neurons, and there are maps, and a part of that is already computed in a brain platform. And then if you look to humans, this was already said, this is a huge number. If you go to the uh, connectivity, which is much higher, uh, this is uh, extremely difficult, even if you have several supercomputing centers uh, to program that and to learn with that. Okay, this was already said. Uh, what we are studying, uh, we are not uh, from robotic side on the molecule uh, level. There we get maybe some parameters of the model. Uh, but we are interested in one cell. We are interested in circuits functional circuits uh, to compute them and uh, to train them. They are, of course, uh, related in region, and there are now a lot of interfaces to the projects in the human brain where we work with uh, the individual uh, research groups. So where it's interesting, this was also said, um, neurocomputing, computing itself, they were, these are different paradigms to uh, two days computing and medicine neuroscience was already mentioned in the previous talks. So which type of neuron is the right one? Uh, of course, we said it should be in some way plausible uh, so that we have the threshold, that we have a relaxation time, that we have the amplification basic functions. And then, uh, the models we are using actually are simplified to that one. We would like, uh, um, if we have adequate hardware, to simulate and then to simplify them, uh, as you see here in this analog circuit, which allows to general uh, spiking trains, incoming trains, outcoming threshold 
and amplification. So that's one part. And uh, if you look for humanoid robots and um, trying to make a robot learning what is observed, uh, the technique is more or less programming by demonstration. We observe a human doing something, grasping, uh, moving, walking, uh, playing uh, table tennis. Um, then to map it on a model, uh, one is possible to have a realistic skeleton model, but this is a high dimensional space. So at the beginning, we simplify that. And then we map uh, the sensor data uh, to uh, our motor controls, uh, to spiking neural networks, and train them till they are doing this, what has been observed, and it's a type of replication. This does not mean that it's already learned, but we can replicate that. And uh, the last one is then to make tests with real robots. Uh, here is um, uh, one robot uh, from uh, Italy. Uh, this is a robot for research, a humanoid one with uh, two legs, uh, spine, two arms, uh, five finger hands. And uh, the other one is uh, to have a robot, as you have seen uh, before, and studying the spiking networks and uh, making the experiments. This shows you um, the visual part. Um, this is a data set from IBM, which is uh, processed here. The idea is to show how fast a computer can identify in, uh, uh, in an image uh, a known object, a cat, a tiger, an animal, or a person, and then to uh, compute that. Oh, let's repeat. So these are images, and uh, within, se uh, within seconds, um, the brain can recognize these objects, and uh, we are testing that watch, how uh, artificial eye, a camera, uh, how fast this can be processed to uh, identify that. And we have do, uh, done that with a spiking camera. It's a dynamic vision system, a camera from Switzerland, uh, which uh, we are using for this uh, test. Okay, why uh, spiking neurons are of interest? Instead of bytes and code and, and uh, a conversion of signals into digital representation, we only use spikes. It means we can work on the joint level, on the muscle level, on the percept level, and uh, generating these uh, trains. Uh, we have the threshold, it's a very simplified model, and we can fire. We have the time instant, and we can combine most of them. We can uh, use the plasticity um, and uh, to inhibit or to accelerate uh, the system. So um, the question is how to compute yes, and uh, which type of neuromorphic computing is uh, of interest. We heard today the Spinnaker systems and the brain scale systems. There are also others worldwide under develop which, uh, development which could be applied. So a typical experiment is uh, when um, this is a toolbox, a framework, and uh, what we are interested in is if we study motion and the visual part uh, is uh, one, of course, uh, to uh, make use of the camera data. Um, but it's important to have something like an episodic memory. If you observe something, it must be stored. So we assume there are cells in the brain which are able to store. Um, structural plasticity is uh, important. And then, of course, uh, some mechanism to learn, uh, to learn motion primitives, and then uh, to use a tool, a framework where we are using a liquid state machine which allows to uh, exploit the plasticity of the individual neurons. Um, here is the hardware, uh, the robot experiment building the interface. You can, of course, also simulate part of that. But the robot is like uh, to see experiments. Here you see the camera. Um, this is uh, the dynamic revision camera. Uh, each uh, pixel is represented by a spiking train. What you he see here is a data set from IBM to evaluate the camera fast movements. What the camera is doing, um, it don't make stationary images, it only fires if there is a movements, fast movements. 
And then for each pixel where movement is detected, a spiking train is generated. We are using that for uh, predicting, learning, and then uh, generating uh, movements. Classically, we means to um, adapt this uh, image. And um, if you use spiking train, you have only spikes. So you have no more um, uh, this um, uh, conversion into this format of the whole trajectory in the image. We use only for significant changing in the image uh, spiking trains to work with, which makes the system extremely fast. Okay, how to learn is that we use different uh, uh, camera. We have a data set, objects to train the system. Uh, then we have uh, here object prediction, uh, error prediction. This means to modify the environment uh, because there is noise and other uh, uh, disturbances. Uh, lab labeling the object to identify what it is. And then we have a circuit, neural circuit, where it's possible to uh, compute. Um, okay, and then um, after training, there's a testing phase where we have a robot arm, five finger hand, and um, the camera, and uh, showing you how it can learn. The neurons which are used, we call them label neuron, error neuron. Uh, then we have uh, the learning neuron itself, and then input output neurons, which are integrated in such a circuit in the functionality, and then uh, showing uh, you how it uh, works. This is a movie. This is uh, the basic mathematics huge used for calculating uh, the input of the neuron. Where's the movie? Wow, that's not wrong. It's my key movie. <clears throat> Uh, we tested it, but it <laughs> okay, starting again. No. Okay. Ah, yeah. Thank you. So this um, are showing uh, uh, different objects uh, to the robot. So here you see the output of the camera. You get only pixels if there is uh, some movement. If the camera wants to see the object, it has to apply saccades to move the eyes uh, in X and Y uh, to get uh, the images. Humans are doing that, exploiting saccades. And here you see that if the eye moves, you see the firing uh, neurons. So we call it micro saccades, then we have macro saccades, but uh, we are using that um, here uh, in the form of a micro saccades. It's uh, three per second is possible. And I think humans have about eight, eight saccades per second uh, to identify the environment. Okay, the system is trained, uh, it's labeled, then uh, uh, the operator is modifying its position so that we have noise and then the second step is uh, to reduce the noise and then uh, to continue the training phase. Okay, that's the reason why uh, the object is uh, moved in a small uh, original environment so that we have not one-to-one -one, uh, imaging, but we have the uh, noisy environment of objects of, of this kind. Okay, then the background is labeled with the camera, so we can subtract the background, also using the saccades, and then concentrating, focusing to the area of uh, interest. And then finally, uh, we go to the evaluation um, that the uh, recognition of the object is triggering uh, grasping. And uh, here you can see the spiking trains, and, and then uh, the recognition, this is difficult for um, or, uh, ordinary uh, vision systems uh, to uh, um, identify transparent objects. 
and then left and right uh, cameras is processed, can observe it its own hand, and then grasping that. This is one example. Uh, industrial robot can do that much better. This is optimized, but this uh, is learned and uh, show, uh, is used to show the principle. So what we have done in the project is to use industrial components to show that we can run with spiking uh, uh, controls and with uh, neural uh, biomorphic structures. Uh, a 60 degree uh, of freedom is a lightweight arm and uh, then using a five finger hand and so the ICAP robot this is the small humanoid from the IIT Italian Institute of Technology there it's planned uh, in the last phase of the project to integrate that okay here you see uh, grasping uh, uh, the object uh, the first is to classify to classify to localize and then uh, to grasp and uh, grasping itself is trained, and in the future we will use uh, optics. Okay, now these are uh, the uh, details. I think time is too short to uh, uh, explain that. But what is done is to explain the multi-layer training which is used. Uh, so uh, it's a back propagation mechanism where from level to level, local back propagation and optimization is done. And uh, we have shown that we can uh, manage types of this uh, benchmark from uh, um, IBM to test that. Okay, the learning curve, I want to, uh, cannot go into uh, details. Um, important is that um, you know the characteristic of uh, the motor primitives. Uh, what has to be learned to approach the object, to open the hand, uh, to have contact or to grasp, and which signals from the cognitive level are necessary for that. These are some details how you can train that using the simulator. You find, can find it on the platform uh, of the neuro robotics platform, loading down one robot, loading a training uh, procedure, and then to show, to reach objects or to train different motions. Uh, you can select uh, uh, neurons, uh, neural networks, and uh, learning the motion, uh, the basic uh, movements in this uh, system. Okay, um, target reaching, then there is a, um, a motion with contact. For example, if the robot has uh, to touch on walls or to open a door, it's important to get a contact or to have repetitive motions, cyclic motions, they can have been studied uh, with uh, individual nets. So where the liquid state machines have been applied to uh, learn and uh, to use the plasticity. Okay, finally, um, you can plan uh, obstacle-free motions, for example, preventing a human to have collision with a robot. This means that a camera or the robot is observing the human and that motion is immediately generated which avoids uh, collisions. And there we designed a 3D uh, memory which is implemented with spiking neurons. One where the robot identifies its own body and the second memory where the robot identifies the volume of a, a, um, of an obstacle or of humans working with that, and uh, then we show how to process uh, this. Stereo mode is possible, calibration. Instead of these curves, we have only spikes, and you can calibrate the camera so that it's possible to localize the object and then to generate a movement collision free to reach it. Okay, finally. Um, these are some experiments, how this memory looks like, how to uh, compute the voxels. You can also plan collision-free paths. Um, there are uh, different algorithms how to uh, exploit that. And finally, um, there is uh, the message that we can accelerate uh, the individual uh, processing time up to real time. Uh, I heard that brain scale chips are too fast. We have to slow them, but I think we have enough to compute uh, so that uh, we can make a good use of them. So this was a short 
survey on uh, robotics, uh, how we use it in the brain. Again, we are not, um, what we are looking for uh, individual aspects, like motion, like motoric part, like the visual part, how to connect that, focus of interest. There are, of course, other things if you have a complex task, which is much more difficult uh, to store in the brain. So we are looking for basic mechanisms, and uh, you are invited to go in. Thank you very much. Thank you.